Welcome to APCUG's Wednesday Workshop, where we get together in the middle of the week to learn more about technology. Today, we have a very interesting presentation. And if you try to figure out from my background, we're going to be talking about something that's invisible. John Kraut's back with us, and I'm always excited and always learn from his workshop, something new and different. And he's going to be talking to us today about invisible apps. And I'm curious about that because I've known about the portable apps that we've had uh, workshops on and presentations, but I was curious about invisible apps. So most of you all know John, he's been with us a number of times. He comes to us from the Washington DC area and the Pat Aces uh, computer group. And he's got a huge history in his background. And we thank him for last month's uh, workshop on 4th of July. Hope some of you got some great firework pictures. So John, turn things over to you and tell us about these uh, invisible apps. All right. John, thank you for that nice introduction. Um, folks, I'm going to uh, start sharing and the first thing you're going to see is a black screen. Do not panic. That is normal and expected. You haven't broken the internet. That's just me. I use that to turn off some things that would otherwise block my slides. Here we go. There's the black screen, and I'm going to turn off a couple of things. Let's see here. I'm going to turn off the video panel and I'm going to turn off the floating meeting controls and once all that disappears and I get rid of this latest entered the waiting room message there we go we can start all right so sometimes when I show you things uh, what I uh, do is uh, embed QR codes and when I do a lot of that I give you a, a brief summary on how you can make use of those um, and this time I only have one, it's at the very end, and I don't have any web page URL, so I won't show you QR codes for that. Uh, the next slide, though, provides instructions on how you can capture on your computer or phone any of the slides that you think are useful to you. And let's start with Windows. If you're using a Windows computer to watch this presentation today, you can use this keyboard combination, uh, the Windows key, uh, and while you're holding that down, you tap the print screen key, and that will store the current slide in a folder for you call, uh, under pictures called screenshots. For Mac, you hold down the shift key, you hold down the command key and tap the number three, and that will save it to your desktop folder. For Android, if you're using an Android phone to watch, you hold power and volume up. I would recommend holding the volume up first because if you hold power for a long time, it'll turn off your phone. Uh, and that stores it in uh, internal storage in a place called DSIM and screenshots. And why that fourth row appeared while I was talking, I don't know because I wasn't literally touching either the keyboard or the mouse. It's magic. iOS, meaning Apple phones, Apple, uh, I, uh, Apple iPads, um, Let's go back to that one because I didn't even get to say it. Uh, you've got a couple of keystrokes you can use, uh, home plus volume down or power plus volume up. I would prefer using the home key. Uh, and that'll store it in your photos along with all your other photos as it happens. Okay, now let's get to the title, Invisible Apps. And this actually uh, became a focus of mine about 10 years ago when I got my first smartphone. I'll explain. Um, but let's make sure we're all up to speed on the tech jargon. Uh, you know that in every smart device, whether it's a smartphone or a tablet or a computer, there is a, a device called a central processing unit or CPU. And that is the chip that knows how to execute programs and the operating system, which is itself a bunch of programs. RAM or random access memory is simply the memory which a CPU can find and execute instructions. So 
That means that when it's running an app for you, that app must be in RAM. And also that's where the CPU can create and modify data. Now, there's another type of memory, particularly in portable devices called flash memory. Uh, you've heard of a flash drive or a thumb drive, uh, but flash memory is built into your portable device and that acts as permanent storage, meaning it'll store things when the power is off. It's far greater in size than RAM. And uh, effectively, it's the analog to a smart, uh, uh, to a computer's hard drive or solid state drive, because we store things there so they'll be available to us when we turn the power back on later. Uh, multitasking, now this is a big part of every one of those devices, uh, personal computers, tablets, and smartphones. It simply means that your computer or tablet or smartphone can each run multiple applications at the same time. And that means they all have to be in RAM to run at the same time. Um, personal computers came into our lives first before the tablets and the smartphones. And from the com computer experience, we learned some things such as this. Windows taught us an easy way to identify applications that are running even when we cannot see their screen windows. This portion of the computer screen uh, for Windows is called the taskbar. And in the taskbar, anything with a line underneath it is running. For instance, I circled one here on the left for you. That's File Explorer. One in the middle, that's Firefox, a web browser. And over here on the right, LibreOffice, which I use to prepare these slides. So that gives you a sense of what computers have taught us to expect. But in portable devices, it's not so easy to see what's running. It's relatively easy to remove one app from the screen and run another app. But when you remove that first app from the screen, it's still running, still using part of the CPU time, still in device RAM, still using battery power, and perhaps still using the internet. Now on a portable device, these running apps are normally not seen. So it's easy to forget about them and what they, how they impact your, uh, your portable device. I call these unseen running apps, invisible apps. And when you accumulate a large number of invisible apps, what happens? The phone heats up or the tablet heats up and slows down. Even charging the battery slows down. Now, why are invisible apps allowed to exist? You might want to copy data from one app and paste to another app, and you have to be able to switch between the two to accomplish that. So that's one reason. You might want to do product identification and price comparisons at various stores and online retailers. So you might have a few tabs open in a web browser, and you might even have uh, your camera open to scan the barcode on a product to see if you can find a better price. So it turned out 10 years ago, I learned the effect of too many invisible apps the hard way. And we all know the hard way is usually the most powerful education. I bought a, an iPhone 5. That was my first smartphone. And I did not know about invisible apps. I kept my phone running all the time. I had my oldest kid was in college at that time. And I wanted to be able to hear from her if she had to call me even in the middle of the night. One day while I was at work, the phone slowed to a crawl and was very, very hot. I mean, the sort of thing that if you have it in your pocket, you can tell if you have it in your hand, you want to get rid of it. It was that hot. And so I went online use the web to research the cause. And I found out it had something to do with what I learned about the way operating systems work when I was in graduate school in the late 90s. 
well, actually, it was the early 90s. Yeah, early 90s. Um, I found out how to see and shut down the invisible apps because they were causing the problem. And I'm going to explain that in detail. I had 64 invisible apps running that day on a phone that had only one gigabyte of memory, RAM, in it. Now, that RAM is the key. When you run an app, as I said earlier, it occupies RAM, the only place where CPU can execute the app's instructions in software. But when RAM fills up and you start another app, the operating system moves the least recently used apps to flash memory out of RAM to make room in RAM. And they do that until they have enough room to run the new app that you wanted to start. And that's why sometimes starting a new app takes a long time. It's a relatively slow process because flash memory is much, much, much slower than RAM by a factor of roughly 100. Now, those swapped out apps are swapped back in by the OS occasionally, especially if they use the internet because the internet data is coming in and the apps are the consumers of that data. That's not the only reason. There's many other reasons why they might be swapped in. But every time something has to be swapped in, when RAM is full, something else has to be swapped out first. And it can get extreme. And that's exactly what happened to me. In extreme cases, the CPU spends most of its time swapping apps. And that means it can't spend much time executing apps. So I'm going to show an example of what I, I think sometimes when you're teaching people something that they have not had any occasion to try to understand previously, it's good to have a drawing. And we're going to show you a drawing. Let's assume that there are six apps named A, B, C, D, E, F that are in some sense running, but they can't all fit in RAM. So RAM is too small to contain them. And so we find the first three that uh, were, when the next three were uh, running, the first three were swapped out to flash memory. Here I've illustrated that as a box with the word flash at the top. And D, E, and F are in RAM. So those are currently executed. But from your viewpoint, you can't see which apps are in which places. You just know they're all running, or you may have forgotten that most of them are running because you can only see one on the screen. So the user taps app A to resume its use. This is what happens. App A is not in RAM. CPU swaps out app, it picks an app that hasn't been used recently, in this case D, and it swaps it out. It puts it in flash. So here I've crossed it out in the RAM box and I've put it into the flash box. It has to open up memory first before it can restore A to RAM. And then it swaps in app A, removing it from flash, putting it in memory, so that it can resume the execution of app A. So what this suggests to you is that when something goes into flash memory, when it's swapped out, that means its current state, which, which, uh, which means the last executed instruction in the, in the software, is saved so that it can resume at the very next instruction. Now, Swapping does have other causes. There are many other causes why things are swapped in and out. Not just somebody trying to use one again. The point is that when RAM is full and swapping happens several times per second, the CPU is unable to respond quickly to you or any application user. And that may be why, for instance, if you're sitting at your computer and you click on something, it does not respond immediately. And that means that something's being swapped out 
and then swapped in to make it possible for you to use whatever you clicked. There's a technical term for that behavior, and here's something you can use to amaze your friends. It's called thrashing. And that refers to the fact that RAM is full and the CPU spends almost all of its time moving stuff in and out of RAM between the swap out area and the, the uh, RAM itself. That's called thrashing. Okay, now, that was 2012. What, ha what has happened since then? Portable device CPUs, RAM, and flash memory are all faster. And in some cases, there's more of the RAM and the flash memory. Uh, the amount of RAM has not grown as fast as flash memory, however. So here's a comparison. iPhone 5, that first iPhone I had, one gigabyte of RAM and 16 gigabytes of flash memory. But look at what you can get. And this isn't even the most recent iPhone. This is an iPhone 11. It has four gigabytes of RAM, so it grew by a factor of four. And either 64 or 128 or 256 gigabytes of flash memory. So the flash memory grew by a factor of at least eight. And the reason is that flash memory doesn't cost very much and the price has gone down. And here's the interesting part to me, apps and their features have grown tremendously. So an app that may have occupied, oh, say 150K of RAM in 2012 would now maybe occupy five megabytes of RAM in uh, this year. And in fact, I can point to one that's commonly used on uh, smartphones, the Adobe Acrobat Reader app, which is over 200 megabytes. And so heating up and slowing down is still a real possibility. Um, Mr. Angle, I will answer all questions at the end. I find fairly often that when I answer questions in the middle, it really it's something that I cover in a later slide. So please hold on to it. Uh, apps have grown faster than device memory, RAM. And the symptoms of running many invisible apps can still in happen, and they include a very slow reaction to your taps, heat buildup, and very slow charging. And keep in mind, heat buildup is especially damaging to your battery. And that is a subject that I discussed in a previous presentation on extending the battery life in your smartphone. But heat is the mortal enemy of your battery, so you should avoid it. If you find your phone is heating up, especially for no reason, you need to look into why. And I'm going to show you how to figure out whether or not it happens to be invisible apps. So you can learn how to see the invisible apps, how to shut them down, and how to reuse an app if you need to copy something to it or you need to refer to it for some reason. So let's look at iPhones first. Now, this particular discussion applies to iPhones using iOS 16 and 17 because that's what I have available to me. And it turns out there are gestures that you can use, meaning movement of your fingers on the screen that will reveal invisible apps. It won't, it won't show you all of them at once, but you can scroll through them. A gesture is movement of one or more fingers across the iPhone screen and Gestures to reveal, browse, reuse, and or exit invisible apps, shut them down completely, involve a single finger. Really easy to learn. Now, something else I found out in iOS 16 and 17, when you have invisible apps running and you literally shut down power on the phone, those invisible apps will resume their operation when you restart the phone. I don't know why Apple chose to do that, but it did, and you need to be aware of that. Okay, 
Now, the first thing is something you probably are all familiar with already, you iPhone users. How do you make a current app invisible? The one that's visible to you on the screen. You place your finger at the center of the app on the screen and drag up and to the right, and it appears to drop back into the app icon. That app appears to shrink itself back and, and uh, resume its icon state, but that does not mean it has stopped running. No, not so. It's still running. Older iPhones with the home button, instead of using the gesture, you tap the home button. And that was true of my iPhone 5. Okay, now, what is the gesture to allow you to see invisible apps? That gesture is to place the finger at the bottom of the screen and drag straight up to the center. And what you see is something like what I've captured here and shown to you on the right. And you'll be able to see three apps. That doesn't mean only three are running. If you see fewer than three, that means two are running or just one. But you will see what we call a tile and you will see an icon above each tile. Um, and this is how invisible apps appear. And I circled the tiles up there while I tried to. Um, and uh, each tile has its icon at the top left. And so if you're familiar with the icon, you can tell uh, which app is uh, associated with that icon. And the one in the middle even has its name shown next to the icon. And you can browse. You can swipe left and right through the list of, of apps and uh, see all of them. There may be 20 or more. Or in, in my horrible case, in 2012, 64. Um, and just by the way, those apps include both the ones that are currently in RAM and the ones that have been swapped out. And you can't tell the difference by looking at those tiles. To shut down an invisible app, you tap and drag the app straight up out of that set of tiles. To shut down several of them, you can drag the tiles straight up using multiple fingers. Now at most, since they only show you three at a time, you can use three fingers and drag three tiles straight up. There's no single gesture to shut down all invisible apps. And as you can guess, because of that, it took me a very long time to shut down 64 invisible apps. But it's real easy to find, once you've found an invisible app that you want to continue using, you just tap the center of its tile, it will occupy the full screen, and there you go. On, onward with that app. Um, now we're gonna switch to Android devices, and we're gonna talk about Android 13. However, this mechanism I'm going to show you it has been in use in Android for quite a long time. Um, Androids have buttons. The older ones had physical buttons like my uh, Samsung Galaxy S7, the S10 and the S20 have in, uh, what are called virtual buttons that show up on the screen. Now here are the virtual buttons on my uh, current phone, uh, which is the Galaxy S20. Uh, I call them the big three. The one at the left with the three vertical lines is the task changer. That's the one we're going to use to see invisible apps. The one in the middle, which is a square with rounded corners is called the home button, which takes you back to the first screen of uh, your uh, main uh, most frequently used apps. And finally, the back button which sometimes does the same thing as the home button, but inside an app, it can also move to a prior screen of the app. But the one we're gonna focus on is task changer. If you do not see the big three, then tap and drag the bottom of the screen up. Probably only have to do that about a quarter inch and those virtual buttons will appear. Um, and I already mentioned what home and back can do, but task changer allows you to see those invisible apps. 
Now here is the default view of invisible apps. And again, it involves tiles and they're arranged in left to right, sort of left to right so you can scroll through them just like on iPhone. To uh, resume use of an invisible app, you tap the app tile. To close an invisible app, you tap and drag its tile straight up. But there's a great convenience in Android phones for closing all invisible apps. It's at the bottom. I've circled it in red for you here in this illustration. To close all of them, you tap the close all button. There's another way to do it. Shut down and restart the Android phone. That will not restart invisible apps, unlike the iPhone. So the close all button is your friend. Now, um, it turns out Samsung Galaxy phones have a great convenience from the uh, Galaxy Store, which is operated by Samsung. You can download free apps to customize the appearance of invisible app tiles, and in particular, to let you see more of them on the screen. The default appearance and four others are available. You're going to see the others on the next slide. And I emphasize that you have to use the Galaxy Store to obtain this capability, not the Google Play Store. Here's the first one, it's called a grid. It lets you see six at a time and it puts the close all button on the left side. I circled that for you here. There's another one called a stack and it lets you see a bunch, but not as clearly as grid. There's another one called vertical list, and it only lets you see three, but it gives you, well, one, two, yeah, oh, four, sorry, I can't count today. Must be my allergies. Um, and finally, the one I use, which is called slim list, I put stars by it, because you can see 11 apps at a time. And I think that has a particular value, that's the one I use. Um, now, these instructions to, are particular to Android 13 Galaxy phones. I think it'll work on Android 12. I did that on my uh, Galaxy S10. Uh, if you've got an older Android version, uh, the uh, Galaxy Store may or may not be able to help you. I, it just depends on how old your version is. Uh, you download this app from the Galaxy Store. It's called Good Lock. It's a pun on a Korean, uh, Samsung is a uh, Korean uh, a company and it's a pun on something that is very important in Korean culture, good luck. You open that app and in the first screen, tap Make Up. In the second screen, tap Home Up. And that will allow you to uh, uh, install a second app. That app is by itself completely useless, useless, excuse me, until uh, unless you install Goodlock first. Uh, and once you've installed that, here's how you make use of those other types of invisible app displays. You open the good lock and tap home up. On the home up screen, which is shown on the right here, you tap task changer. And the task changer gives you a list of different types of displays. They call them layouts. And you just tap the corresponding radio button for the one you want. When you tap it, you will see it. Uh, a, a tiny example of it on the right in the same task changer screen. You also have to make sure that the in use button is on. That's at the top of the screen. Um, I mentioned it earlier, when you shut down and restart your Android 13 phone, invisible apps do not survive. When it comes up, it will have no apps running. And I believe that's been true on every one that I have used 
uh, since I bought the one I bought after uh, the iPhone 5 was the Samsung Galaxy S5. And I believe that's true on all of the uh, versions of Android that I've tried. So here's some recommended practices. iPhone invisible apps survive a shutdown and, re and start up. So if you, in particular, you see any slowdowns, you, see, you experience any heat up, it's time to look at invisible apps and close the ones that you don't need or, or just close all of them. If you shut down your iPhone at night, then review and remove all unwanted invisible apps before you shut it down. And that way they won't be restarted without your knowing about it. If you use phone apps frequently and your computer is nearby, then consider using your computer to do some of those frequent things like weather, news, email, instead of your phone. And that way you won't be running so many apps and forgetting about them on your phone. Um, now, another important thing to, to consider when you are deciding to purchase a phone. Manufacturers advertise the flash memory size as the device capacity, and they don't advertise RAM. But believe me, you want a faster phone, you need more RAM. So you need to ask the questions or look at the specifications for the potential phone purchase to make sure you're getting a lot of RAM. Now, the thing that flash memory does, of course, is to store your apps and your data. So that's valuable too. I'm not denying that, but that's also fairly inexpensive compared to RAM. And of course, what they call capacity, meaning flash memory size, has nothing to do with the amount of RAM that is in the phone. Um, Apple has done something else that's very interesting and actually gives them a, a performance advantage. They have uh, adopted a design approach of integrating in one chip, the CPU, the RAM, the flash memory, and the graphics processing. They call it system on a chip. And that reduced parts costs, manufacturing costs, and possibly power consumption. It definitely increases system speed because all those things are tightly connected. Very, very short connections. Uh, also on the computer side, they have created the same thing. Uh, they just released the M4, uh, M1 through M3 are all systems on a chip as, in sim, as is the M4 with the same impacts. It's very impressive. Now, I've come to the end. In a minute, we'll take some questions, but I want to mention something that's coming up later on this month that you might want to attend via Zoom. Uh, my club, the Potomac Area Technology and Computer Society, or PAD ACES, uh, is offering a meeting on the afternoon of Saturday, July 20, starting at 1 p.m., and I'm going to offer a new topic called Secure File Deletion. And you may wonder, is there such a thing as insecure file deletion? There sure is. And that is normally what you do when you delete a file. We're going to show how to make it completely gone. As a member of an APCUG-affiliated group, you are welcome to attend by Zoom. You do have to ask for a guest pass. And this is one way to do that. You write to this email address and you ask for July 20 guest pass. Include your full name, not a name like Megan's iPad, but your actual full name, your city and state, and your user group name. Now, if you do know how to, you can save this file, and I even gave you the hints for Windows and Mac here on, I mean, save the screen. And I even give you the hint, uh, the hints for how to do that with Windows and Mac on the bottom of the screen. But if you have a phone and you know how to scan a QR code, you might want to do this, scan this QR code, because your portable device, after scanning this, will open your email app and write the email for you. You will still have to fill in the spaces in that email for your full name, your city and state, and your user group name, and then hit the send button. And that's it. Okay, I am done. I am going to stop the share. And at this point, we can see 
How many questions people have come up with? Well, I learned something new as always, and I already have that Android app down, and there's a lot more to it. I gotta take some time to look at all the other features. Yeah, Samsung gave you a tremendous flexibility in how your phone is organized and how you interact with it through that Good Luck app. But uh, the one I think that people most often find immediately useful is uh, uh, changing the style of the invisible apps list. I'm going to have to open up some apps so I can see the choices. Okay, you ready? Why does Apple encourage us to leave the apps running in the background rather than shutting them off? That's a good question. And they're not the only ones. Yeah, I even, in the late 1990s, I owned uh, an early example of a portable device from Hewlett Packard called a Jornada. They did about the worst thing that you could do. They put an X in the upper right corner of every app that occupied the screen. Now, if you're a Windows user, what does that X tell you? Click the X to exit the app. Except guess what? That's not what happened on Jornada. It kept running. So I felt like they made a big mistake. Why Apple does that? I don't know what the justification is. Clearly the official justification is to give you the flexibility to copy data from one app to another or to make reference to one app when you're using another app. So um, the side effect of that is that uh, it is. It remains possible to run many apps and just forget that they're still running or they're at least uh, available in the list of apps. And of course, then eventually, if you <laughs> ignore it for a long time, like I did back in 2012, uh, you end up with a, a phone that's thrashing. Uh, and just by the way, that phrase was, that word was invented in the early days of virtual memory operating systems um, in the 1960s. And it has persisted ever since because computers do that all the time. Big computers, you know, mini computers, mainframes, anything running Unix or Linux, um, even Windows. Does the four does the four finger down swipe still work while addressing open apps on an iPhone? No, three fingers, not four. Thank you. How do you get a total count of open apps? On iOS, you only see active ones. Well, <laughs> I wish I could give you a nice clean answer. Uh, Flip all the way through the list, count them. I, and I, I wish there was a better way. Uh, I don't know of one. Okay. I am interested in Android apps that truly run in the background. They don't show up on the list of, as John calls, running apps, invisible apps. Can things like Snap Bridge from Nikon, it runs automatically in the background. I want to only run this program when I want when I want to run it, but I don't know how to restrict it to only run when I specifically start the program. Um, hmm. I'm good. I'll tell you what. I think that's worth uh, looking into because I just loaded a, uh, an app that I wasn't familiar with on my Android phone, and I t it had an option in its settings to run it when the phone starts. And so I made a point of shutting down my phone and uh, restarting it. And by golly, it started right up again. But it doesn't show up in the list of running apps. And there is an alternative type of software called a widget for Android phones. And I suspect it's a widget at that point. But I, uh, again, I'm not sure I will just have to look into it. And if you send me your answer, I can send it out. 
Now, well, was there an option to not run it at the uh, startup? Yes, yes. So you might be able to go back and do that. Okay. Yeah, oddly enough, that particular app, its main point is to allow you to run other apps at startup. And what I was running, was, uh, what I used the app to run is the uh, battery monitor app that uh, tells me when my phone is uh, discharged to 20% or charged to 80% in order to preserve the life of the battery. Um, so that battery app now runs constantly as well. So to, to translate it for me to be easy, phones have start menus just like Windows has a start menu. Is that a correct statement? I don't believe so. No. I have I, I see a number of apps on my Android phone that I can scroll through. Uh, I see a number of apps on uh, several screens of apps on my and on my iPhone that I can scroll through. Uh, there's uh, as far as I know, there is not another start uh, the equivalent of a start menu on Windows. Thank no, you. I, I would well, I would say on mine, you swipe it up from the bottom, and then all your apps are there. Yeah, I would say your home screen is is sort of like your start menu because you can customize that and put whatever apps you want on it. Right. John says when you swipe up, you see all your apps that you have installed on your phone. Yeah, those are accurate statements. When you swipe up on an and and just so the audience is clear on this, we're talking about Android phones. You swipe up on an Android phone, you see an alphabetic list of your apps. If you don't do that, the default screen is one that you organize so that you can have your most frequently used apps on that default screen. In that sense, it's an analog of the start menu. Yes. Okay, got a couple of comments. On a phone, can hit home button twice to show what is running and then drag up to close. There was no name on that. And here's another comment. Most of the Samsung apps are also available in the Google Play Store. But not all. Right. Um, um, yeah. Most of the Samsung apps. Right. That's not right. right. The, one, the one that John mentioned is only in the Samsung Store. Okay. Now, knowing Samsung phones from what Bill has talked about before, does that, if you have a Samsung, you have access to different apps than a Motorola phone or something like that? To some extent, there's a number of things that are, are that change. Uh, there are different options within the settings app. I know this because my son uses a Motorola phone. Um, there is an app that I find extremely useful. Uh, most of you who have Windows computers know that one of the things you use the most is the Windows File Explorer. There's an app that uh, Samsung provides called My Files, which uh, functions on an Android phone a whole lot like uh, file ex uh, Windows File Explorer functions on a Windows computer. And I use that a lot. Um, that app is a freebie for everybody who has an Android phone. It, does, it, it is not restricted to Samsung phones. It can be used on any Android phone. I agree. I use that a lot too, John, as well. Yeah. I gave uh, a presentation recently on um, um, file managers, and I and I talked about my files as being the equivalent. Yeah. Uh, just to, as an example, to take the screen captures that I have found that I created on my Android 13 phone and get them into the presentation you saw today, I used my files to copy them to my NAS network attached storage. And then from the NAS, I could insert them directly into my slide deck on my computer. So it's a, a simple and easy way to uh, move, move files around when you need to move files around. Okay, I am finished with my questions. We've got a little over 10 minutes for live Q&A. Ostertag, you're on. I'm going to give my spiel. If you'd like to be able to share with us or ask a question, use the button down to the bottom that says raise hand. 
because that puts you at the top of the list. We have almost 200 squares in Hollywood Squares. And if you raise your hand, we're not going to see it. But if you put your uh, raise hand, it goes to the top of the list. And that's how Judy knows that Tom is going to be up to bat in one second. Hi, right, Tom. Unmute. Uh, yes, uh, your question about how you can tell how many apps you have on your iPhone. What you do is you go to settings and then you go to general and you go to about and you look down there and you find out how many apps you've got. It'll tell you how many videos, how many pictures, how many apps. In my case, I got 301 apps. Um, and do I use them all? No, I use about 10. I so, do not believe that that shows you how many are running. What? I do not believe that uh, part of the uh, settings app shows you how many are running. No, I didn't say that. I've got 301 apps on the phone. Okay, do I use 301? No, I use about 10. <laughs> okay, my question to you is, why in the world don't you remove them to make more space? Because I'm lazy. Oh, Tom. <laughs> That's an honest answer. I know. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> anyway, you're on Mark, but John's answer that he gave uh, about um, 192 people here, if we opened up the presentation time to 190 plus people who wanted to ask questions, uh, John Kraut would have never gotten through with his. Uh, Al would never be able to get have time enough to do his. We use the chat box, and when there are no more questions, then there's live Q&A, okay? So you're on. Um, okay, I'll be quick. Um, I lost uh, John early on in the presentation because I didn't understand, for example, how to swipe. He was saying up and to the right on an iPhone. Well, that to me means up diagonally. And I tried that and it didn't work. And so I wasn't sure what he meant. And then I lost him and he was talking about iOS uh, programs. I don't know which one I'm using. Um, and um, so it, it's kind of like this was more an advanced user's presentation, I gather. Okay. So you will get, if you, if you are using the name that you, uh, today, on this meeting that you used when you registered for the meeting. You will get a copy of the slides in a PDF file, and you can sit there and read at your own pace and digest. So I, that's something I strongly recommend for everyone. Or you can you. find an iPhone SIG at another group and ask if you can attend their meetings. They probably will say yes. Pierre, your question, please. Yes, good morning or good afternoon. Um, I don't have questions. I have a few comments that I'll go through uh, as quickly as I can. First of all, thank you, John, for a very well presented uh, set of slides. Um, about invisible apps, maybe it would be, uh, people would understand better what uh, what we refer to when we say invisible apps, if we were to call them background apps, because they are just running in the background, they're not in the foreground, okay? Just uh, maybe to make it more understandable. Uh, on iOS, somebody made a comment, why did Apple allow invisible apps? Well, uh, thankfully they did, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to go back and forth between two apps and potentially uh, copy and paste information uh, between two apps. So uh, the fact that you can have more than one app running at any given time is actually a, a godsend. It's the same concept that you have on, on a computer where you can launch more than one program and go back and forth between uh, the, the two or three or four, whatever. Um, number of invisible apps, yes, there is no uh, known way of of uh, uh, finding out how many uh, background apps you have running in iOS. Uh, you can always count by sliding 
uh, horizontally once used uh, uh, you have slided up but uh, there is no no indication of how many uh, it's true that the phones do not have a start uh, start button or start menu uh, however as, as uh, somebody else um, uh, mentioned uh, if you have a start button on your iPhone, if you're running an iPhone SE, or if you're running a very old iPhone, yes, uh, if you go to the, back, the home screen that way, that's sort of your start menu. If you have a more recent iPhone, you simply swipe up from the bottom, not all the way to the middle, just a little bit, uh, maybe halfway through the screen uh, to, to clear everything. Or, But anyway, there is no start button. Um, Yes, the double tap, as I've already mentioned. And if somebody is interested in an Apple for Beginners workshop, uh, Tech Ed Connect, that I'm the president of, uh, does have such a workshop. If you are a member of a club that is in good standing with APCUG, you can also join us at only $10. We call that an associate membership, and you get full benefits like everybody else. So I'm not the only one who does a commercial. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> Steve? Nope, Sig. Oh, sorry, I'm looking the wrong way. Sig. Thank you. Uh, oh. Quick question. Um, is there any way to find out what resources, how many resources the invisible apps are using or to even better sort them by which ones are resource intensive because you might want to selectively close down the ones that are doing a, <clears throat> using a lot of resources and let the other ones keep. Well, there's, there's one answer to that that I'm aware of and it's not much. Um, it is possible by looking at each app in, in Android when you start uh, the settings app, one of the choices in it is called apps. It gives you an alphabetic list of the apps and you can look at each app and see how much memory the app itself occupies and how much cache and how much data it has as well. So that gives you a measure, but it doesn't tell you much of anything else um, uh, such as, uh, well, I can get really technical here, but I'm I, frankly, it's been a long time since I was in graduate school and I'm not sure I'm going to get it right. So I'm not going to get technical, but that's the only way that I can tell you to look for resources used by an individual app. And yes, I like the other gentleman who, who spoke earlier, I too use it maybe 10 or 15 and I've got over 300 on my phone. And, and in some cases, because I was writing articles about them, but that doesn't justify keeping them around forever. Um, still, uh, whether you've got 20 or you've got 300, that's the only other way I know that you can check and see how much resources are tied up by an app when it's uh, uh, in the invisible apps list. Thank you. And, and yeah, I, I want to comment on why I use that term. You, uh, any of you who have ever done a presentation knows that having a snappy title helps draw your audience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jill Edwards, wherever you are. I'm here. Uh, I was the one who wrote the comment on my iPhone 2020 SE. If I hit the home button twice, the apps that are running show up and then you just slide up and you can close them. I don't have my iPhone here, so I can't test that. I'm sorry, I'm in my basement. I do it on the it. iPad too. Okay, that, that is absolutely correct. But it only applies to iPhones that have a home button. Okay, we have George and Jerry, and that is Carl. Is that next? Carl, George, and Jerry, and then we're off to Al. Carl, you're on. My, I had to turn my speaker on, mic on. Thank uh, you. I try to find Galaxy uh, Store 
So um, what happened, I went, I did a Google and a Google search, but I also tried under, uh, you know, my, uh, uh, what's it called? Um, Play Store. So under Play Store, I typed in uh, Google or Galaxy Store. And I get uh, a lot of uh, apps for Galaxy, but I didn't find the one that you were referring to, John. What brand of phone do you have? I have the uh, S24 and I'm running uh, 14. So that's the Samsung Galaxy S24. Correct. All right. At the bottom of your screen, if you swipe up and look at the alphabetic list, of apps. I did. I did not see Galaxy Store. Is there a Samsung folder at the beginning of the list? Uh, yes, there is. Open that folder. Okay. Uh, of course, I see. Uh, uh, let's see if there. Well, the last it goes from find and the last one is wearable, which I'm using for my watch. Smart things, smart switch, uh, messages, members, my files, global goals, find. I don't see. Uh, okay. I, I am unable to explain why you do not have a Galaxy Store app on your phone. I do not want to suggest that there was any, how do I put it, conscious decision to delete an app but sometimes things get deleted and we don't realize we've done it. That's happened to me. So uh, I don't know what to tell you, uh, but there, there are numerous techniques that can get you that app. Uh, one, one involves developer options where you obtain a package from somebody else who has the same phone, and then you uh, a package is the term for uh, the file that literally contains the app. Uh, it has the extension APK, and then you can copy it onto your phone. I know that's not what you want to hear, and I'm sorry. I wish I could give you a better answer. One other yeah. possible thing to do is go to the very end and see if it's out of alphabetical order. I've had apps that get added on to the end, and then I have to put them back in alphabetical order. But Galaxy, the store, should be there for Samsung. Well, I see at the end store, but I, maybe that's by default means Galaxy. Let me try it. Yeah, that's it. That's it, store. That's it. Yeah, I have a red icon with a, a white shopping basket imposed on the red background. It's, and in my phone, it's Galaxy Store. You got it. George, you're I on. I can't show it to you. Miss Taylor. Miss Taylor, you... Unmute, allow me to unmute and push me to the end when I was after Sig. George Bowden, it's your Can turn. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, well, let that fellow go first. I mean, no, oh, he's leaving. <laughs> um, I have a Galaxy, um, a Motorola. I'm cheaper than cheap. I don't go for the iPhone. That's expensive. I don't even go for the Samsung. Um. I have a Motorola Power G 2022. And um, one of the motivations for this talk was about reducing battery power. I find that when I have my Bluetooth on, my battery usage climbs tremendously. And I'm wondering if there's apps and background apps that that come on when you enable the uh, the Bluetooth that are off when they're not. And when you say invisible apps, there's, I still think there's a bunch of stuff happening in the background that isn't even shown as apps, but is controlled by other functionality that you can turn on and off. Uh, the short answer to your question is yes. Um, and I can give you a specific example. Um, there is a tracking device called a tile that you yeah. can purchase. And I have. Uh, tiles communicate with the phone via Bluetooth. But Tile has the ability to turn on the Tile app capability 
in other phones so that those other phones, if they detect your tile, can tell you where they detected it. But that means those phones are using Bluetooth without the oh. conscious decision of the person who owns the phone. Yeah, I have a and, tile, and uh, it's specifically for that reason that I turn oh. off the Bluetooth. And when I want to find uh, my keys where I keep the tile, um, I have to turn the Bluetooth back on. So you have one right tile. Again. I, I have, uh, well, I have a couple, but. Yeah, you have a couple. My daughter gave me two about four years ago, and I'm now up to 20. <laughs> because I own cameras, I own camera accessories that are expensive, um, and uh, I put one in my car. Um, if my car gets stolen, I'll be able to find it. Jerry Crow, you are our last question. Thank you, and thank you, Judy, for sending that link. Um, I just wanted to ask if anybody, uh, somebody talked about not having the time to get around to deleting apps. I wish I could, I use my phone mostly as a phone. I have only three apps that didn't come with the phone. And of course, maybe this is true for all brands, but on my Samsung Galaxy, I cannot uninstall apps that were already on the phone when I got it. Oh, yes, you can. Good. That's what I'm asking, John. Okay. Um. That's my there, question. There is uh, a seminar that I teach on Android bloatware that shows you three ways to uninstall apps. And the third way even uninstalls, uninstalls those apps that Samsung or your manufacturer or your carrier installed in a way that doesn't allow the normal deletion of the app. I can't remember if I've taught that for APCUG or not, Judy. You have not. Thank you. Well, you answered my question. I guess that there's no short answer, I guess. But but uh, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, you'll you'll find out. Okay, good. Thank you very but much. Trust me, I added that to my list here of requests. Thank you so much, John. Outstanding as usual. Learned a lot. Thank you for your questions. We appreciate them because look how much more we learned because of the questions and the answers. And if somebody can't answer it, somebody else will answer it for us, which is all about users, users helping users. And that is the motto of many of the APCUG member groups. Over to you, John. <laughs>